but it's a delight to have him with us. So maybe I ask you to welcome uh, Jeremy Bing. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, I should have ensured that you have the handout. Everyone you got, all got that? Yep. Good. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Tom. And what a delight indeed, what an honour to be asked to give this lecture. Um, and also a particular pleasure, because I've, um, I've had to reread a lot of the texts and the books, the articles that have shaped me theologically. And I've made all sorts of discoveries, rediscoveries, whatever, and it's been an enormous pleasure. I was about 19 when I was first pressed into exploring Christian faith. I was armed with a heady mix of extreme prejudice and almost complete ignorance when a hyper-energetic and former school friend, Alan Torrance, persuaded me to fill up an elective requirement in my philosophy degree at Edinburgh. Why not go and hear my father lecture? He said, do you remember? He's a theologian. So I went along. It turned out that James Torrance was lecturing on something called dogmatics, a word that did nothing to hasten my conversion. In fact, <laughs> It made me feel a little like Wesley in reverse. My heart was strangely cooled. <laughs> but anyhow, I came to the Father through the Son, so to speak. I was <laughs> gripped by grace for the first time, moved as never before. Now, the climax of that term for me was having to write an essay on the resurrection of Christ. I was told to read a book just released by T.F. Torrance, whom I'd met, but I didn't really know, James's brother. James always referred to him as my brother Tom. He said it with a just a little kind of reverent lilt. It was always in the same way. It was with a little pause beforehand, which I just, I just loved. He never said Tom. It was always my brother Tom. It was almost like he was bowing. It was a wonderful kid. Okay. Anyhow, the book was Space, Time, and Resurrection, the first Christian book I ever read. On one level, of course, I could barely understand a word. After all, I'd never read the New Testament, never mind Bart or Athanasius or in the other exotic figures that were quoted. But on another level, I was gripped by the sheer audacious sweep of this text. It seemed to cover the creation of all things to the recreation of all things. I never realized Christianity said so much about so much. And sure, it was a messy book. As John Webster later said of Torrance, on occasions, analytical and logical order, as well as elegance and economy of phrasing, are compromised in the rush of ideas. But back then, I would have said, who cares about analytics, logic, elegance, and economy when you're being swept up in a vision as comprehensive and compelling as this? To complete the anecdote, at that time, I was set on a career in music. And soon, of course, I was bound to ask, what did this awe-inspiring worldview have to say to the world of Beethoven and Bach, Monteverdi and Mantovani, not to mention Elton John, then at his height? And here, T.F. didn't seem to have much to offer, especially with Elton John. His writings on the natural sciences were voluminous, of course, but although his prose had a rhetorical and dramatic power of the arts, per se, he said very little. Given this, you may wonder what on earth someone speaking on Torrance and the arts might have to say. In fact, I've come to believe he offers a huge amount to those seeking to envision or re-envision the arts theologically. I'm going to highlight some key areas where I think that is very evident. I've had to cut out about three or four, but I'm concentrating now on four in particular. Four Torrancean distinctives, four accents and leading themes especially associated with this theologian. And I want to bring them into play with key concerns in the current theology and arts dialogue conversation. We quickly find the traffic runs in both directions, from theology to the arts and back again. Not only can Torrance's theology invigorate the arts, the arts can in turn invigorate the theology he sought to commend, indeed free theology of some of its worst bad habits, linguistic and conceptual. And I think there's a parallel here with T.F.'s work in the, national, in, the, in the sciences. He found theology greatly illuminated the work of scientists, but he also found that engaging with the physical sciences could enable theology to be more faithful to its subject matter, catafusing. In short, the artist can learn much from a Terencian, but the Terencian can learn a few things from the artist. 
So, what can T.F. Torrance offer to a theological visioning or revisioning of the arts? First of all, a Christologically integrated cosmic vision. Back to space, time, and resurrection. Yes, it was the staggering scope of this book that first struck me from creation to new creation. But what gave the argument its sting and its drive was the way it cohered around the decisive particularity of Jesus Christ. Torrance was determined to expose the stubborn testimony of the New Testament to the singularity of Christ. That the very raison d'etre of the created order, its past and its future, is to be found in Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal Son made flesh. More fully, and in line with the Irenaean and Athanasian tradition, he insisted that the created order is to be understood, quote, in the light of the relation of the incarnate Son to the Father, unquote. From this relation of love, vitalized by the Spirit, all things sprung into being. And into this relation, all things will be enfolded in the new creation. The whole universe, Torrance writes, is ontologically bound to the incarnate and risen Jesus. And because of this, he could say creation proleptically is, pro is proleptically conditioned by redemption. Now, the incarnation and this vision is never to be dissipated into a cosmic principle, as Torrance often said, and as he thought he saw in some early Logos theologies. The incarnation constitutes a particular engagement of God with the world, an unprecedented and irreversible enfleshment of the Son of the Father the one through whom all things were made. This is how creation is renewed. This is how humanity is renewed. He is the one in whom fallen nature has been remade, the new Adam, who now invites us through the Spirit to be remade in his image. Caravaggio, The Calling of Matthew, 1599. Matthew, the tax collector, sits at table with four others. Jesus and Peter, on the right, have just entered the room, and Jesus singles out Matthew. Most scholars assume Matthew is the man here with a beard, pointing to himself, as if to say, who, me? Most telling, perhaps, is Jesus' hand, surely echoing the hand of the Creator in the Sistine Chapel. God is recreating Matthew. But on its own, that isn't enough, for the hand, when flipped, resembles much more closely the hand of Adam in that painting. Recall the second Adam theme, Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, God the Son, as the new Adam, recreates Matthew. If you ask for any more there, it would be almost greedy, wouldn't it, theologically? And although perhaps not overt in the painting, as Richard Hayes underlines, when Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation, everything old has passed away, see, everything has become new. The word ketisis there refers to the whole created order, not merely to a renewed individual, echoing Isaiah 65. Well, in the UK in the mid-1970s, this kind of Christologically integrated vision was fairly rare in the halls of academia. Nowadays, we have many singing, if not exactly from the same hymn sheet, at least from the same hymn book, in their different ways. Oliver O'Donovan, Richard Hayes, Richard Balkum, Tom Wright. Tom Wright owes a huge amount to T.F. Torrance. Let's remember. Even when he doesn't acknowledge it, he does acknowledge it, but even when he's not acknowledging it, he, say, he told me when he first read Space, Time and Resurrection, he was in tears virtually throughout. Isn't that interesting? And also two very good collections recently edited by Andrew Torrance, co-edited by Andrew Torrance, I say, on these themes. Nevertheless, for some reason, this biblically grounded vision has yet to make serious headway in the theology and arts arena. And I'm as guilty as anybody else here. Here, we have too often worked with what Ben Myers aptly labels Christologically anemic doctrines of creation. So in the circles I move in, we talk about the rootedness of the arts and the goodness of creation, but often fail to mention the one through whom creation came into being. 
and through whom it has already been made new. We talk much of the body in the arts and wax eloquent about dance and the importance of recovering bodily arts like dance, but often fail to mention the resurrection of the body of Jesus where the dance of the new creation has been embodied for us. And if we do speak of Christ, too often he's abstracted from the particularities of time and space to become little more than a cipher for God's universal presence. And in the arts, then, are brought in to underwrite such an ontology. But here let me point just to one crucial area where Torrance's Christologically cohesive perspective could do much, and that is in thinking through the concept of beauty. I'm sometimes accused of having no time for beauty, something that offends my wife deeply. Not true. I, for one, am very grateful for the outpouring of books on theology, the arts and beauty over the last 10 years or so. Well, longer than that, actually, 15 years at least. But a couple of warning shots, I think, are worth sending across this fashionable theological steamer. First, about the way many will jump from the arts to beauty and beauty to the arts without a second thought, as if the one inevitably and necessarily entails the other, which I think is questionable. As, for example, when it's assumed that the arts are distinguished as such by their aspiration to beauty. Second, and this is the more important thing, if we are to engage the concept of beauty, we need to be wary of theologies of the transcendentals or a particular version of the transcendentals that seem to bear little relation to what has been performed for us in the Son made flesh. If we're to speak of created beauty or even God's beauty using the classic qualities such as radiance, diversity, unity, perfection, attraction, and so forth. These will need to be constantly reshaped, it seems to me, around incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Now, of course, von Balthasar, in his own way, moves in this direction, but the Protestant tradition has its representatives also. Interestingly, recently, Mark Mattis has shown that this kind of move was made by Martin Luther. For him, it seems God's beauty reaches apogee in the form of divine mercy enacted in Jesus Christ crucified. Christ's beauty is his radiant compassion for the lost, his solidarity with the outcast, the miserable, and the despicable. It's as if he's saying a theology of beauty needs to descend to the dead with Christ. If this is so, we will need to learn to sit at the feet of Dostoevsky again, and Flannery O'Connor. We will need to feel the force of W.B. Yeats's words, love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement, for nothing can be soul or whole that has not been rent. We will need to ponder again what Bart meant when he said God's perfect beauty embraces the ugly as well as the beautiful. Or to come at this another way, we'll need to resist the easy slide of beauty into sentimentality, perhaps the most perilous danger facing Christians in the arts today. In music, I think the towering figure here to mention is the Scottish Roman Catholic composer James Macmillan, who draws on a range of harmonic and rhythmic techniques to construct what is best described as a musical counter-sentimentality. If, you if you're not familiar with his music, the, the work to start with is Seven Last Words from the Cross, still his masterpiece. Or an artist like Lanicia Roos Tinsley, preacher turned artist living in Houston, who will talk much about beauty, but it's a beauty inscribed with cost, in her case, drawing on the experience of losing a child. By the same token, Taking Torrance seriously in this area means that the classic components of beauty will need to be given an eschatological charge. Here I can't resist a delicious quote from James K. A. Smith, who is pushing much more firmly into theology these days. In his book on political theology, he comments, how many paradigms of supposedly Christian political theology operate as though the resurrection of Jesus had never happened? Same could be said of paradigms of Christian theologies of the arts. Yes, of course, there's the danger of triumphalism here, a kind of Joel Osteen triumphalism of a premature grasp of the end. 
But this, I think, is where we can draw on Torrance's marvelous description of the Christian life as marked by a double time. This comes particularly in space, time, and resurrection, but elsewhere as well. The old time, I'm quoting him now, that runs backward into nothingness, that crumbles into the dust. No mystic existence. And the new time of the new creation that runs ahead of us, or to change him as meets us from the future, sealed in the risen Christ and ushered in by the Spirit. It is this second time we must treat, surely, as primary in every sense. And in the arts, as much as anywhere else. It's all too easy in the arts world, I've found, out of a desperation to avoid even a whiff of triumphalism, to end up assuming that the more fractured our art is, the more emotionally violent, the more drenched in pathos, the more profound it inevitably must be. To put very crudely, that misery is somehow deeper than joy. The Torrancian question, for all the problems that, it, you know, that you've got to deal with around this, I appreciate that, it's not a simple thing, but the Torrancian question should haunt us. Are we living as if the resurrection had never happened? What kind of order is being taken as ultimate? A Christian vocation in the arts surely means at some stage, in some way, being a harbinger of the new time in the midst of the old. Peter Kuzmik, a missiologist, Hope is the ability to hear the music of the future, and faith is the courage to dance to it now. I find this eschatological perspective amongst artists, people are very nervous about because they think it's going to be naive and sentimental and triumphalist and rest of it. Ever read the New Testament? I mean, of course there are problems and dangers. But there's extraordinary fascination with the present moment. I <laughs> found a lot of theology and arts talk. This is from a, a dear student of mine, Bethany Tobin, now a missionary in Bangkok, with her husband called Pentecost. And I think particularly those in the front will see that these are scraps of music, manuscript paper with music. Pentecost, the music of the future in the present. Another witness here, fascinating writer Christopher Page at Sydney, Sussex. Uh, among other things, many other things, a historian. This is a book on the history of singing in the first thousand years of the church. And he's found some fascinating documents in, I think it's the third century, which show that a number of uh, groups of Christians regarded singing as a bodily anticipation of the resurrection bodily life. The use of the voice is one of the principal continuities between the states of bodily life on either side of the grave. To press this a stage further, if the new creation is about recreation, maybe artists of faith should be speaking less about creativity and more about recreativity. I hope some of you have seen the show Stomp, in which the most banal, ugly, discarded objects of the sorts you would never look at normally are turned into almost two hours of choreographed percussion. Not a word is spoken, not a note of music is sounded, and there is no interval. Now, notice the kickback for the theologian in all this. The arts, at their best, can deliver a jolt of the imagination which makes possible a deeper penetration, a deeper penetration of the vision someone like Torrance is seeking to commend. And in turn, this can provoke fresh language and conceptuality to bring that vision more fully into light. Both ways, theology for the arts and back again. Second theme, vicarious humanity, a classic Torrancian theme written into the coat of arms of any Torrance society, right? You haven't got a coat of arms yet for this fellowship, have you? But you could have, you could have. Let's explore the implications of this just in one area, the vocation of the artist. I use the language creativity a moment ago. Today, we link creativity in the arts without blinking. We encourage kids in schools to be creative in paint and dance and sound. We talk of creative artists. 
But of course, in Christian antiquity and most of the medieval period, creator language was rarely used of the artist. God might be spoken of as an artist, the scriptural precedent for that, but not the artist as a godlike creator. Only God truly creates, only God creates out of nothing. It seems, and I'm cutting a very complex story short, but anyhow, it seems that from around the end of the 15th century, this divine creator language spills over into the human sphere and gets implied to what we now call artists in particular. It's what TFT would have called a dangerous communicatio idiomatum. This linguistic trespass is many-sided and complex, but among other things, it laid the ground for a typically modern portrayal of the artist as one who aspires to a godlike freedom over the world, as if apart from time and space. In some versions, mastering and controlling nature, paint, sound, stone, the materials, whatever, to his or her predetermined purposes. And with this goes an exaltation of novelty and originality which, of course, is a gesture towards creation out of nothing. Uh, Steiner, George Steiner, hinted at this in his really quite eccentric but very intriguing vision of the artist as raging against God's let there be. The artist is, as it were, deep down furious that there's already something there. Uh, but he believes that's one way of understanding as born of a kind of primal rage. There's much more to Steiner than that, but at least he toys with that idea. Now, it's not hard to see here the parallels with TF's observations about scientists who see their task as aggressive interrogation, where the physical world is seen as at best indifferent and at worst hostile to human flourishing, needing to be tamed and controlled. An extreme version of this, a variation on it is probably a better way of putting it, can be seen in some of the early 19th century romantics where the artist, standing apart and somewhat above a less than friendly world, assumes gargantian powers traditionally attributed to God, with an infinitely abundant imagination and the ability to transform the world. Now many, when they meet this kind of thing, sense waves of nausea, especially if they're low church Protestants. No, the artist is entirely human, finite and sinful, indeed exceedingly sinful. The artist doesn't create anything, certainly nothing new. He or she only reports or highlights what she already finds. Stick to landscapes and still life. You can't go wrong there. That will soon put a stop to your fantasies about being divine. No, art is an entirely human activity. As one influential writer on the arts used to say, Christian writer, the arts are purely human, not one whit divine. But the problem with that, of course, is just a kind of zero-sum game. Either human or divine. God and humans in a kind of competitive standoff. It also, the other zero-sum game, it tends to pit creativity against discovery. The artist is either a godlike creator or merely a discoverer. I'm, I'm putting things very starkly to make the point. I mean, historically, you need to qualify this in all sorts of ways, but you get the point, I'm sure. What's needed, as many of you will be saying, and I can hear Tom saying this over my shoulder, what was needed, of course, here is a recovery of the vicarious humanity of Christ within the hypostatic union. This is, in fact, is the argument of a sadly much neglected book, but a very important one, I think, by Trevor Hart, formerly of St. Dan well, he's... He's still in St. Andrews, but a rector of a church now. Trevor Hart, in his book, Making Good. He insists that God doesn't allow or permit his creatures to make and fashion art, but actually calls them to do so, inspires, enables, and equips them. God's renewal of all things doesn't exclude human action, but includes it. And this is not because God is powerless without us, as if God lacks what we possess, but he freely and graciously wills it to be so. We want to know how this could ever be, how divine and human can coexist in this way, then of course we need to circle back to the vicarious humanity of Christ. You remember that in Torrance's Chalcedonianism, the humanity of Jesus has no independent hypostasis of its own, it's the anhypostasia, it is the humanity assumed by the eternal Son of the Father. What this opens up then is a vision Something like this. To be creative is to share in the life of the human Christ who himself is the new creation. 
to be inspired. And by the way, someone really needs to do a whole thesis on the doctrine of uh, inspiration in this world rather than the philosophical categories we normally borrow. To be inspired is to share by the Spirit in this new creation now. Share in the new time in the midst of the old. And a lot of writing, I'm sure you may have come across it, on creativity and artistic creativity begins with Genesis 1 and the image of God, which of course I believe in and I'm not against it, <laughs> at least the text. Uh, but methodologically that's got a lot of problems. This is a far richer environment, and in my own view, the very way that these earlier Genesis texts, of course, ought to be read, Christ himself as the Imago Dei. Now, I hope you'll see, these damaging zero-sum games between divine and human begin to fade rapidly, something underlined by Rowan Williams in his most recent book on Christology and creation. Not only that, the zero-sum game between creativity and discovery. And for a few minutes, I just want to work that out in one art form, in music, and particularly in music of J.S. Bach, for whom I have a special fondness because he's lucky enough to have the same initials as me. <laughs> in his book, Bach's Dialogue with Modernity, the eminent Bach scholar John Butt, presently in Glasgow, extraordinary musician and scholar, he sets Bach against the background of the nascent modernity of the early 18th century. Like many others, he argues that crucial to the emergence of modernity was a waning of confidence in the cosmos as our intended home, and an increasing confidence in the power that humans construct, sorry, the order that humans construct, whether by hand or mind. Now he wants to argue that Bach spans both pre-modern and modern outlooks. That's the gist of the argument here. On the one hand, he points to what was almost certainly Bach's own attitude to music and cosmic order. The ancient view that music is, or at least ought to be, an engagement with a God-given order embedded in the physical world at large. On the other hand, he writes that however much Bach may have believed in the natural order to which harmony pointed, there is a level, his music contains a level of constructedness that is unparalleled for its time. And this is evidence of a more modern accent on the immense possibilities of human making. Take, for example, just to get a tiny taste of this, the fifth prelude from the first book of the famous 48 Preludes and Fugues. <laughs> And so on. Let's just look at the opening of that. P starts with four notes. Everything that follows derives from those four notes. We take those four notes and invert them, this is a technique known as inversion, or flip them upside down. We get this. And now we've got the first eight notes of the piece. This opening pattern can be replayed at various pitches, it can be stretched and compressed. So here, for instance, you'll see the one on the right is a slightly compressed version of the one on the left. And so out of such techniques, we're given a stream of 16th notes. Now what's particularly interesting about Bach is he, he couldn't leave anything alone, that's the point. He couldn't let something just be. He will always see the potential in what we would regard as the most banal, pathetic, unpromising little tune, and sometimes that's just two notes. This is what scores of scholars have noted. And by the way, we'd be very careful with Bach. It's not that he sees two or three things and then organically develops it, very dangerous word, Larry Dreyfus of Oxford has attacked that. He's not an organic composer. He doesn't just let it come out. He's constantly interacting with it, shoving it out, turning upside down with it. It's not an organic unfolding. That's not the point. I think that has very significant resonances with certain kinds of doctrine of creation. Now, here's the point. 
There's something utterly radical in the way that Bach's uncompromising exploration of musical possibility opens up potentials that seem to multiply as soon as the music begins. By the joining up of the links in a seemingly closed universe of musical mechanism, a sense of infinity seems unwillingly, sorry, unwittingly, <laughs> yes, unwittingly to be evoked. And yet he can, in other words, it's just the, from the beginning there is what's called elaboratio, elabora, as it was known in those days. But Brach can also write this extraordinary set of words. The more exhaustively the potential of the musical material is researched, notice the word, the more real it becomes, or seems to become, as if disclosing more of the ultimate nature of matter. <laughs> this is a musicologist, please. Probably an agnostic, never quite know with John, but knows quite a bit about theology. So he never suggests that Bach's celebrated and breathtaking artifice works against that. Now, of course, I want to say the only re of really holding these dimensions together, broadly invention and discovery, is through a Christologically grounded model of creativity. And this, of course, John Bach doesn't understand. John, John will tend to see Christianity as not able to make up its mind. It's either trying to go back to nature or else it's obsessively interrogating nature in the kind of modern thing, right? The idea that you could have both of these. He sees, as many actually musicologists I've met see, that Christianity is just totally in contradiction there. It can't work that out. That would be like, isn't that interesting? But anyhow, notice the kickback the theologian gets here. A theological outlook is being brought to Bach, yes. But Bach gives a concrete demonstration of something that shakes up our imagination of what is conceptually possible and practically possible, banishing the zero-sum games that have so often held us captive to echo Wittgenstein. Third point, third area. Okay, third. A vigorous anti-reductionism. Now, reductionism must be one of TF's most persistent bet noirs, the flattening of description or explanation to one uniform level. So, for example, he opposed any kind of cosmological reductionism that reduced entities to their constituent part, constituent parts. John Keats famously spoke of the Newtonian scientist unweaving the rainbow, as when a rainbow becomes no more than water droplets reflecting light of different wavelengths. Of a piece with this is the tendency to see the so-called higher sciences, like anthropology and biology, reducible to the so-called lower ones, like physics and chemistry. So Francis Kick, Frick Crick of DNA fame, could confidently claim that the ultimate aim of the modern movement in biology is in fact to explain all biology in terms of physics and chemistry. Hard luck if you're a biologist. Another type of reductionism can be found in popularized evolutionary biology. The belief, for example, that human life can be and is entirely to be accounted for by showing how it answers to a particular need or type of need defined solely in terms of bi biological or evolutionary processes. Fortunately, there are now many well-written reposts to this kind of nothing buttery. Torrance himself counters it above all through the model of stratification drawing especially on Michael Polanyi. This will be well known to all here, I'm sure. The natural sciences he held show the world to be multi-leveled, each level requiring a distinctive mode of inquiry. Levels are open upwards, but not reducible downwards. And of course, in this outlook, the contingent order as a whole is viewed as an open system, open upwards. In Torrance's words, it constitutes an essentially open system with an ontological and intelligible reference beyond its own limits, unquote. In other words, to God. Now, there are other kinds of reductionism Torrance opposes as well. For instance, linguistic reductionism, the belief, or a certain type of linguistic reductionism, the belief that only the literal and empirically verifiable propositions associated with the natural sciences can mediate authentic truth and knowledge and that these operate through one-to-one -one correspondence with reality. You'll all know, I'm sure, Torrance consistently eschewed all such narrow and, 
I like to call them enclosing accounts of language. He also had no time for what we might call technological or pragmatic reductionism, where the value of something is gauged by how useful it is to me now. Tom mentioned the Scottish connection. Um, I'm sure you go climbing in the Highlands often, or have. I used to go climbing with my brother-in-law, who was an engineer. And we used to get to the top of these peaks, and I used to look out and say, wow. And he used to say, do you know, if you were to put a dam just about there. Torrance also had no time for what he might call techno, sorry, I've said that already. What has all this got to do with the arts? That's the point. What has all this got to do with the arts? A great deal. Most obviously, it will help us counter any attempt to submit the arts to crude reductionism. To explain the arts solely in terms of physical causality or evolutionary biology. To treat a Rembrandt painting as no more than a dressed up statement. To justify music education in schools simply in terms of its immediate utility. But just as important, and here's the kickback for the theologian, the arts themselves, I believe, stand as our, probably our most powerful witness to the poverty of reductionism. A few words about this. I've written this up quite a bit elsewhere, but just a very quick dip into this topic. It's long been recognized that the arts, by their very nature, seem to be inexhaustibly evocative. Hilary Brand and Ad Adrian Chaplin memorably contrast Van Gogh's famous painting of worn down shoes with a two dimensional picture of a shoe we might find on the side of a shoebox. The one on the left answers to an immediate need and answers it well. Once the shoes are found on the shelf, who needs the picture? I've never yet been to a shoe store and found people gazing at, at each of these extraordinary diagrams on the side of the box. The Van Gogh, however, is richly suggestive with its intimations of the earth, trudging, a hard day's toil, and it, of course, can generate further meanings with each viewing. We are never finished with it. Now, this is emphatically not to say that this or that work can mean anything. It is not, in fact, to say that its meanings we can find entirely to the internal life of the fewer. Art like this is capable of disclosure, opening up realities independent of the viewer. Yet, it operates in a way that is multiply elusive. The arts, I suggest, can serve as unique and compelling witnesses to the fact that the finite world we inhabit is of inexhaustible significance. It always outstrips our perceptual grasp. What is the world that art takes for granted? Asked Rowan Williams in one of his writings. It is one in which perception is always incomplete. And that, I suggest, is a profoundly Torrancian sentiment, and one which begins, at least, to open up onto the theological. Now, of course, the arts are not offering knockdown arguments, but they do act as what I like to call stubborn witnesses to the grim poverty of reductionism. And it's a grim world to live in if you're a real reductionist. Cosmological reductionism just sounds ridiculous when you're faced with the production of Hamlet or a concert of U2 and told it is nothing but. Take your pick. Evolutionary reductionism, likewise. There's some evidence that the arts have served particular evolutionary purposes. Steven Pinker of Harvard holds that music is the product of a, dean, a gene for art making naturally selected to impress potential mates and that we ought to wake up to this fact today. But it's surely crass to imagine that pointing to something's possible origin in the evolutionary process fully explains its significance today. Music, actually all the arts, but particularly music, seems to exceed whatever particular purpose is adduced in these terms. Reviewing Pinker, the critic Louis Menon comments, one suspect <laughs> that enjoying Wagner, singing Wagner, Anything to do with Wagner is in gross excess of the requirements of natural selection. No doubt Wagner wished to impress potential mates. Who does not? But it's a long way from there to Parseval. <laughs> Linguistic reductionism is likewise shaken 
The very fact that we all rely on metaphorical and figurative language is enough to put a question mark beside narrow propositionalism in theology as much as anywhere else. Australian poet Les Murray, God is in the world as poetry is in the poem. A law against its closure. As I say, the arts can counter pragmatic reductionism as well. The arts are always wrapped up in purposes and intentions and functions. That's okay. But it's quite another thing to claim that their value is limited solely to this or that particular immediate utility. The music of a hymn may serve the immediate emotional need of a congregation of worship, but it may also serve the purpose of glorifying God through its aesthetic structure, its crafted beauty. Moving swiftly on to the last section, a theological reimagination of time and space. <laughs> These fast topics. <laughs> Let's come at this via music, if I may, concentrating on time and then space. If you go on iTunes and do a search under spiritual and sample a few tracks, you'll quickly find that to be spiritual, it seems, is to be slow. To suppress rhythm, beat or pulse, Indeed, at times to approximate to stasis. Okay, you get the idea. I've sometimes been told that this is one of music's greatest gifts to theology, or perhaps its greatest gift, to offer something akin to an intuition of timeless and, timelessness and experience out of time. This, some will go on to say, is to gesture towards eternity, perhaps even life in the eschaton. These sentiments sometimes also go with an appeal to what is taught to be music's freedom from physical things, its insubstantiality. Music, we are told, is the most spiritual, i.e. non-physical, of the arts. Now, I'm not trying to dismiss a whole genre of music or rubbish this, this or that kind of music, and I don't want to say that there's nothing in the kind of defences that are often made of it. That's fine. But some fairly fundamental assumptions about time are being made in all this, and they're assumptions that Torrance has countered sharply. The key issue at stake, I think, is the twin, it's actually a twin issue of the goodness and reality of time, of whether we're prepared to regard time as intrinsic to the created order and therefore to its goodness. For Torrance, of course, time has been created, assumed and affirmed in Christ and indeed will be redeemed in the new creation. This opens up a rather different account of the value of music as it happens. And, as it happens, it is one that has received considerable support these days from a number of music theorists and practitioners. Think of Oliver Sacks' remarkable work using music with Parkinsonian patients, where, as he puts it, music can give people back their tempo. Fascinating phrase. I think of Julian Johnson, friend and colleague on a number of projects at King's London, most definitely not a Christian, but fascinated in theology, who argues in a forthcoming book that music offers us not so much an escape from time, but a deeper indwelling of the temporality of physical things, like strings, vocal cords, the natural world, through which we find ourselves re-timed. The Polanyi echoes are surely notable. And I think of the remarkable work of Victor Zuckerkandl, Austrian musicologist, who points to the obvious fact that music doesn't simply happen in time. Its notes are critically timed in relation to each other. Its temporal relations are absolutely intrinsic to its significance. Through music, then, we learn of a time, according to Zucker Candle, not as some kind of absolute container or channel, the bowling alley down which the notes roll, so to speak, nor simply something we project from our minds onto the world. But time is an intrinsic dimension of the physical realities of sounds in relation to each other. I know, without more time, uh -huh, this sounds very abstract. 
but the links with Torrance's opposition to receptacle notions of time should be pretty obvious. Again, note the kickback for the theologian. Opposing receptacle models of time in learned books is one thing, but music provides a concrete experience that makes such models seem vaguely ridiculous and in turn generates conceptual tools far more suited to the realities we're trying to elicit. And mutatis mutandis, the same holds for space. Why presume that music is essentially about abstracting us from material space? Could it be, as Johnson suggests, that its profoundest capacity is to enable a reconnection, a deeper bodily indwelling of our material world. To take this beyond music, I do recommend this book, Just Out, by Jennifer Croft, who brilliantly shows how the arts can be understood as a way of rerouting, replacing us as bodily creatures in the spaces we inhabit. That's IVP, is it not, Gary? Yep. And the kickback for the theologian here is even more powerful than in the case of time. Take, for example, one of the key contrasts between visual and oral perception. Objects in our visual field typically occupy bounded spaces. They cannot overlap without losing their distinctiveness. We cannot see red and yellow in the same space at the same time as red and yellow. They will either hide each other or merge into something else. By contrast, the tone I hear when I press a key on a piano fills the whole of my heard space, my oral field. It doesn't occupy a bounded location. We don't say it is there, but not there. It is actually everywhere in my oral space. This is not a point about physics, please. It's a point about the phenomenology of perception. If I play another note of a different pitch along with the first, that second tone fills the entirety of the same heard space yet I hear it as different from the first. In this oral environment, notes interpenetrate, sound through one another. They can fill the same space, if that's the right word, and yet be perceived as irreducibly distinct. In fact, they don't so much fill the same space, they are the space you hear. They exemplify their space. Seen, or <laughs> rather heard from this perspective. Torrance's struggles against receptacle notions of space in Christology and elsewhere now begin to make far more sense. Many conceptual blockages that have dodged Christology begin to dissipate when we allow oral perception, I believe, to have its sway, when we're not ruled by assumptions of mutually exclusive bounded places. The two natures of Christ, the communicatio edematum, canotic Christology. I'm sure I didn't spell it all out. Salvation, just think of the sterile oscillations between synergism and monogism, divine and human action. And of course, the intra-Trinitarian relations. The very notion of divine space. It all begins to make a new kind of sense. I was reading Bart on divine space recently. I thought, why doesn't he mention music? And this is so obvious. In our oral space, we do not hear a three-note chord as three mutually exclusive objects, nor as one fused tone, but as a resonant field. The notes sound through one another. This is not a space with different objects inserted into it. It is a space constituted by the resonant, differentiated life of the three. The three tones I hear, remember, don't have a space. They don't occupy a super or pre-existing space. They are sonic space in action. Enough to close. Back to that sweeping vista I was introduced to all those years ago, climaxing the new creation. I spoke a few minutes ago of Stomp, the musical, if that's the right word, stage, stage event, as recreation. But that's not quite accurate, is it? Something like this gets much closer. Interpreted Christology, this work seems to evoke so much of what Torrance, Torrance was keen to share. A sculpture from Mozambique bearing the title, The Tree of Life, for a while standing in the atrium 
of London's British Museum. In Revelation 22, the tree from Genesis reappears, or rather many trees, standing on the banks of the river of the water of life for the healing of the nations. This sculpted tree is constructed entirely from weapons reclaimed after Mozambique's civil war. We recall Isaiah's vision of peace. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and their AK-47s into the tree of life. Thank you very much.